singer named Justin Moore. We don't do a whole lot of bullshitting up here. We just get up here and play country music. Hey, hey, check one, two. All my lights are blinking. Everything, I got squiggly lines going across my screens. I think we're a go. Here we are, kicking off episode five here on season three of the Justin Moore podcast. I'm your old buddy, old pal, JR the Handler. And on the Zoom machine with me today is my brother, your favorite singing Razorback, Mr. Justin Moore. What's going on, JM? What's up? What's up, everybody out there listening, watching, and I uh, hope you're well and having a great week. And uh, what's up, JR? How you doing, bud? I'm good, man. I'm glad uh, it's not too loud in here. I was worried about that. I've actually finally got the roofers here to fix my roof on the studio and my house from Hurricane Sally uh, back in August, September, whenever we had the hur- the first hurricane and then the damage from Zeta afterwards. So finally got the roofers here. We're going with shiny metal roof. Should help my power bill, I hope. Uh, but yeah, got that going on today. So they've been out there banging and clanging. They worked Saturday and Sunday this weekend. Me and Reese went out Saturday for a little while. Uh, went to a crawfish bowl at Grice's, which was phenomenal. I tried not to rub it in your face and send you a bunch of pics, but man, they were on point. Uh, yeah, we had some uh, last week. Did I tell you? I don't even know uh-uh. if I told you. Yeah, we had. There's a place here called Eat My Catfish, um, and um, it's really, really good. They do a really good job. So they were small, but they were really good and easy to peel. So couldn't yeah. complain. Right. Yeah, these were these were on the small side, too. There was a couple of gems in there, but these were on the small side, too. But anyway, so, yeah, we stayed up a little later than we have been. And then Sunday morning, the roofers are here at 730 banging and clanging. And, boy, that was rough. But, anyway, I'm glad they're getting it done. And we've got great weather, no rain. It's not cold. So uh, I'm glad to finally get this project done and get on the rest of I- the cleanup. I used to put those uh, roofs on at my summer job for uh, at least two, if not three summers. Um, my uncle had a construction business. They would do additions to homes and roof houses and that kind of thing. And I helped him and I put a lot of those metal roofs on and they're actually really easy to do uh, compared to shingles. I would much prefer to put one of them on than, yeah. than shingles. Not as easy to walk on. Right. But but they are easy to uh, put on yeah they um uh yeah the it looks like the prep works the main thing you know they had to go in and re uh get some of the decking replaced and nailed down better and then put the underlayment and then the metal on so yeah i remember uh i did i can i probably did more than this but i remember one metal roof dad and i did on the at, on lake martin where i grew up down the street from our house and I don't remember all of it because I was probably only 16 or 17, but I I remember the part where he and I come off the roof, sliding down the roof, him first and then me right behind him, trying to miss each other from sliding off the roof. Uh, and maybe some of the loose metal falling on us too, as you can only imagine. Well, my, my first day I wore cowboy boots, and yeah. my uncle goes, don't wear cowboy boots anymore. <laughs> He goes, right. you, you got to wear tennis shoes on this stuff. So <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, thanks to those guys for getting that rocking. So um, it, we're gonna do. I, we're gonna go ahead and drop it on everybody. Next week's podcast will be uh, brought from an undisclosed location. We're gonna be on the road. We're gonna do it with uh, some friends of ours that you may already know. So uh, y'all be listening out that next week. Want to thank uh, Adam Hambrick for coming on last week and joining the podcast and chopping it up with us. A lot of good response. Um, we, you know, we were actually looked at this. Uh, we, we talked with some of our people this past week and, um, the most streamed song of all of your tunes, uh, we found out was the ones that didn't make it back home. Second to that was somebody else will the one that yep. Adam wrote that we yep. discussed last week. So very cool. Glad to have him on. And, uh, this Don't- week's podcast. Go ahead, brother. I was say the one that he thought rascal flats cut, right? <laughs> but I ended up cutting, but so anyway. <laughs> Yeah, he thought, man, Justin's really just excited for me that I got a flats cut, so he's going to go out and do shots with me. I'm I love it. Great story. A little inside. Yeah, pull back the curtain. But uh, but this week we thought we'd change it up. We're going to have somebody from the sports world on the podcast with us today. They'll be joining us here shortly. Um, so y'all stay tuned for that. But I uh, want to say, as usual, thank y'all for – uh, subscribing, liking the show, downloading, all that stuff. We're staying on the charts. We appreciate it. Couldn't do it without you guys. So um, so I want to thank you again for that. And without any further ado, I guess if you're ready, Just, we're going to go ahead and bring our guest uh, onto the podcast today. We've got none other than ESPN's own from 
from everything from Sports Center to Outside the Lines, Baseball Tonight. I mean, he's been there for since '06. He's been around for a long time, and uh, he's awesome. We've hung out a few times on the road. Welcome to the podcast, everybody from ESPN. Kevin Nagandi, there he is. What's up, buddy? So, Kevin, you got all your uh, flags up there, and I I seen uh, a Florida Gators one. I'm assuming that's for your lovely bride. Oh, yeah. She made sure, Justin, that I pointed it out to you among all the Philadelphia <laughs> stuff I got. It's right in that corner right there above Mike Schmidt. And then we've got a little gator over there. Like, that's literally the only thing in this basement. We've got dollhouses and a bunch of other toys for the uh, boys and uh, my little girl and then a couple gator things and then everything else is mine. Yeah, that's uh, – so for those out there listening and watching, we, Kevin and his wife and some friends came to a show at the Mohegan Sun and – Connecticut a few years back and back when we could play shows and hang out together um and she's a big Gators fan I'm a big Razorback fan and we we were kind of giving it to each other and I was saying I don't even know why I, I talk smack to any Gators fan because we ain't beat them at anything in decades uh so. but listen listen it was 100% worth it because you got her so ticked off, and I thoroughly enjoyed <laughs> that the heat was off of me for that night. <laughs> I, I know some great pictures, too. So I, I, a, know, I, I know the feeling, man. I know the feeling. So I was going to ask you, because I don't think we discussed it that night, or maybe we did, and I don't remember, but I knew you were a Pennsylvania guy, but I didn't know if it was uh, if it was the Eagles or, or Steelers, because I'm a big Steelers fan. Diehard Eagles fan. Honestly, yeah. that's the only reason why I got into sports because uh, I could. Uh, my dad came from India, um, and he, he, the only way I could connect with my pops was through watching Sunday football with him when I was seven, eight years old. So I could explain some things to him, and then I loved the idea that I could inform my dad. So me and him and my brother, we were all about the Eagles. And then when they won the Super Bowl, I I was at the game, and I had the chance to. to you know, Facebook message my dad because he lives in India and then FaceTime with my brother while he was at home. So it, it, it's one of those family connections. So wow. uh, it came full circle. So it, it's the only reason why. And obviously, I bleed uh, Philly everywhere here in Connecticut. It's the only reason why I got into the sports business because of my passion and love for Philadelphia. Wow, that's really cool. I did. I did not know that as much as we've hung out. I didn't know that. But um, so so you had to be ecstatic a couple was it three years ago three uh, years ago yeah when, when they won when they won and um i forget what they called that play that they called the philly but it was, special the, yeah, philly, the philly special, special. don't they have yeah. a special don't they have a statue of it or something yeah they, they got a statue of the backup quarterback and the head coach and the backup quarterback is gone the head coach is gone and the franchise quarterback's gone oh, all my. in less than three years yeah it, it is I, um a disaster there when you look at uh, three years later what's going on with the football team. Hey, as an Eagles fan, were you guys – I'm assuming I know the answer to this, but were you guys really happy for Andy Reid last year? Oh, heck yeah. Yo, Justin, is he beloved yo, still with yeah, Philly? he is. But the most important thing – it's a really good question too, Justin. The most important thing was the Eagles got the Super Bowl first. Exactly. So then the city could feel better for Andy and root for Andy. Now, listen, Andy was a great guy. And he was fantastic, and he turned the franchise around. But I, I think it was uh, the best decision for him as well as for the Eagles when they parted ways. And and honestly, I was rooting for him in the Super Bowl again because uh, I, I want Andy to succeed. I, I think he's grossly underrated uh, when it comes to great coaches because uh, he is a consistently year-in, year-out good coach a hall of fame type of coach he needed a super bowl in the resume a win that i think legitimized the conversation of okay let's get him to canton he's a hall of famer well i that that's a uh that's a great point that you made though that it it, it was very helpful in you guys winning one first that would that makes total sense to me like if as a razorback fan if if we had this Hall of Fame coach and he goes and wins it somewhere else after getting so close with us before we do, I can totally understand that. So. Yeah, yeah, totally. Hey, wait, wait, wait. First off, first off, I I'm on a show, and I appreciate you guys giving me the Philly love. I'm on a show with an Arkansas guy and an Alabama guy, and we're getting ready for March Madness. And how about you guys? We're not talking Kentucky. We're not talking Florida. We're talking Alabama basketball and Arkansas basketball before the tournament. 
And you guys are had a fantastic season. And men, how about your baseball teams? Like, this is crazy. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pumped up for where, where Arkansas is right now in the SEC. And, you know, JR Alabama, you know, just keep on rolling with the machine and what they do on the football side. But uh, Petty and that basketball team, what Nate Oates has done, incredible. Muscleman, what he's done with the Arkansas team. And I, I just love Moses Moody. Like, you guys are a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, we were going to – that's one of the reasons we wanted to have you on is because March Madness upcoming. Obviously, we got conference tournaments coming up, but it seems like nobody really cares about them <laughs> anymore. <laughs> um, the only team that cares about a conference tournament, in my opinion, is the one team that wins it. Yes. Everybody else, yeah. Everybody else goes, ah, we were just getting ready for the NCAA tournament. So, oh, yeah, they'll play, they'll play it off. Yeah, you know, no one got hurt. We're good to go. We're getting into the big dance and all that. That's all that matters. Yeah, right. I'm pump, I'm like I said, I'm pumped. You know, I, t- having Arkansas having good teams. Now we've seen that before, but it's been a while since Bama's had a really strong team, and especially not having Florida and Kentucky in in the SEC rocking like they always do is just strange. But uh, but for us, you know, I, we've I've said it on here before, we've had good teams back in the day when I was growing up in the '90s, early 2000s. We had some, and even in the late '80s, we had some great teams. Uh, but we were always overshadowed by the Kentuckys, Arkansas, LSUs that had these star players. But, you know, we had McDice and Robert Ory and Latrell mm-hmm. Sprewell. I mean, we had some studs, but we never got to go very far. I remember, I think, Sweet 16 once or twice and maybe the Elite Eight with Whip Sanders. Uh, but this team this year, if we're on, if we're hitting, we're as, we're, we're as good as we've ever been. And uh, I'm hoping that somehow, you know, I remember talk, telling your wife, they were like, well, you don't have anything, Jr. because uh, y'all, y'all have had Florida. And I, I – Told her I said if anybody was going to be a new rival, it would have to be Florida because Florida's been good in the last, since I've been alive, you know. Yeah. Uh, but the one thing Florida has that Justin and I both would love to have is the trifecta of getting a football, baseball, and basketball championship all in the same year, like Florida has done twice. Oh, trust me, she reminds me about that all the time. <laughs> I, I, listen, I, I went to Temple University, so anytime I bring up college and. And anything to do with excellence, it's like, oh, 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 oh. I, I don't want to hear it. I, I don't want to hear anything about that. Did you forget what happened a decade ago? And and then I'm quick to remind her, yeah, that's when we started dating. And then all of a sudden they started winning. So I make right. sure that I think I get back <laughs> Good luck, at, charm. at her. You yeah. know? But uh, no, honestly, yeah, that's a great point. I mean, Florida having the trifecta. But I, I love that the the Arkansas program in baseball is getting some respect because at the start of the season, uh, there wasn't a lot of respect. Yeah. And for them to start the, with the, the way they started, and uh, that's that's a big deal. I think what they're ten and zero and number one right now. That's a big deal. That's correct. Yeah. In in, in um, to Jr's point about uh, winning in all three, the big three, if you want to call it that. Um, we were a pop fly away a couple of years back. One out, crazy. A strike. Uh, a, stri- a pop a strike. fly. A routine pop fly. <laughs> Uh, and a corn. Um, and yeah. but there's very few teams not only have done it the same year but done it at all period yeah and we yep. we would have joined those ranks but uh dave van horn our head baseball coach who i'm friends with has done an outstanding job you know it, in sports we always talk about kevin how or you guys the professionals always talk about it we talk about it on this silly little podcast how it's really yeah, the hard least to professional thing you're going to do this yeah. entire week is this. No, your entire life. your entire <laughs> career, your, probably your career. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, it's just so hard to follow a legend, and um, I don't know how nationally known this is, but certainly in Arkansas, Norm DeBryan was a legend at Arkansas and really created Arkansas baseball. Took us to uh, Omaha a number of times, and then Dave Van Horn, who played for Norm DeBryan, comes back after a great run at Nebraska. Come. Comes back home, and I mean, really, we are kind of like over the last 10, 12 years, and this is a mouthful, but just hear me out. We have been like a, an Alabama in football. We're just missing one thing, and that's the, mm. that's the national championship. We've won the SEC. We're always top 10 in recruiting. Our facilities are second to none. Um, and selfishly, as a friend of Dave's, I, I hope he gets to, he gets to uh, get one at least before he – he um he hangs them up. And, and you but, know what? You'll probably you'll probably chime in and agree with this too, Justin. I think nationally, uh, you know, when everybody thinks about SEC baseball, because they 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 just do, they'll go to the LSU's, they'll go to the Vanderbilts because of what they've produced when it comes to the player talent, especially at the pitching position. They'll go to Florida. Arkansas is overlooked. And 
for them to to grab some national spotlight. And I, I think that's really important. And, and and to get over the hump, and if they were to win a title uh, nationally, that is a big deal. Um, yeah. And where where you can be consistently in that conversation, uh, that you guys got to break through, and it's pretty important. Yeah. Well, it, and and I, baseball is my favorite sport, so I keep up with it probably more than than most uh, or some. You know, obviously basketball and football seem to overshadow it somewhat, especially in college. Uh, but I do think baseball, college baseball has grown in popularity over the last six, seven, eight, ten years. Um, mm-hmm. JR and I have discussed that. But uh, people don't realize that, and you do, but as good as football is in the SEC and as good as women's basketball is in the SEC and as dominant as they are, baseball is the same way. Mm-hmm. I mean, Ar- Arkansas, for example, is 10-0. and 0. Uh, they, I think we won the regular season last year in the West or, or two years ago when a normal season happened. Um, and we were picked third. We're 10-0, and 0, number one in the country. We were picked third in the West. <laughs> in the West. No respect. It's crazy. And, but and, that's and how good point. that's how good everybody is, though. It's not yeah, even and, a and thing. The, the reason why, and I'm with you too on the attention that we do not see when it comes to baseball and how I think it's turned around, Justin, uh, in the last ten years, is because now you, you have more access to it, right? Um, and, and whether that's uh, regional channels, whether I mean, I'm not here to pump my own uh, network, but whether that's ESPN Plus, whether it's the SEC network. You get the chance to now at least watch and follow. And I think when you have that type of context, um, you're going to get momentum, right? When you have the ability to watch, follow a team consistently, or if you're just a college baseball fan and you have access to that, uh, that's easily anywhere in the country, it helps promote the sport. I, I think the SEC Network does a fantastic job in, in pushing that type, of, uh, that, that type of content in the summertime once hoops is over. No, I hey, that's not a that's not a shameless plug at all because ESPN I'm so thankful for because I'm such a fan of college baseball and softball honestly because I coach all my daughters in softball. As soon as we get done, I've got five straight hours of coaching to do. Uh, nice. <laughs> three well three different three different teams, but um, wait, 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 wait. What kind? What kind of coach are you? Are you J? Well, Jr. What kind of coach is Dust, Justin? Is is he is he a a yeller? Is he a soother? Is he a, a game manager? What what kind of coach? I would lean towards that game manager. He can be tough on them, but uh, but le- with encouragement. And I mean, just like your classic player turned coach. I mean, he could get out there and dive. He could get dirty with them. He'd do it, you know. Uh, his girls are uber competitive, like he is. He and his wife are both pretty competitive, or he's really competitive. <laughs> so they they a little chip to off the old block for sure. I, I no, love that. That's awesome. You know, honestly, I, I'm I'm kind of uh, somewhere in between. I can be the bad cop or the good cop. It just depends on what my assistant coaches are being at the time, um, and so. <laughs> Uh, now with my own daughters, I'm the yeller, you know, yep. we're all that way with our own children. But, uh, with, I will say we just had our first practice a couple of days back and, um, with my older girls who are 12 U softball, um, it's time to step it up a notch and we were pretty hard on them Sunday and we're going to be, we're, we're taking it up a level this year cause we're doing all travel tournament ball. And, and so you know, lollygagging in practice is not going to get it, and and those little little things we're we're going to harp on this year. So good, man. Uh, honestly, how, especially at that age, yes. How so? How old are your kids? I know you have three. You're just one behind me. And when's the fourth coming? Oh uh, hell no! The fourth coming, <laughs> and the divorce is right afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> because my wife will kick me out of this house. Um, so I got, I have an eight year old boy. I got a six year old boy and I got a four year old girl. Um, the eight year old is, and the eight and six year old are super competitive, which I, we, we love that type of environment, but my eight year old is very, he's got to win literally in everything. Um, I'm pretty hard on him. Um, because, uh, the, I've got a competitive edge as well. Shoot. It's in our DNA. It's who we are uh, as a type A personality. And, and we want the best for our kids. So um, w- we've got them both playing hoops right now. Um, my four-year-old, the, the girl, she 
she, I mean, she grew up with boys, so all she wants to do is tackle them, but also tackle them wearing a dress, which I love. She's got the best <laughs> of both worlds, but she will yeah. not, you know, stand down to anybody. Uh, the eight year old and I, uh, we work a lot with, um, with basketball and he's a big football guy. The guy like he'll wake up in the morning, whisper to my wife, Hey, who, you know, who won this game last night? And then he'll come back. And when I wake up and be like that, uh, okay. So Donovan Mitchell did this in fantasy. What, what happened to Joel Embiid? How come he didn't play? Where's Ben Simmons? Tobias Harris needs to get more minutes. So my eight year old has already embraced this type of conversation. And my six-year-old just makes sure he's like, you know, whatever you like, Daddy, I'm with you. We're, we're going with all the Philadelphia teams. So it's 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 a really cool thing to watch them grow and have their own personalities and embrace what I do. They're all so different. Uh, I know ours are – each of them have such a different personality. Um, and uh, it sounds like yours are like mine and really uh, – I don't know if I gave mine the option, uh, but they're <laughs> obsessed with – they're obsessed with sports just like me, and it sounds like yours are kind of in the same boat. They are. Um, they, they really are, like to the point where, you know, uh, if you're in my house, we can't have anything that says the Cowboys or the Celtics uh, or the Mets or the Braves. We, 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 we run a tight ship here. I, I've got some Florida State stuff that Bobby Bowden gave me through the years. I, my wife will not allow me to put anything <laughs> featuring Bobby Bowden or Florida State in the house. That, that's kind of her rule. So uh, her being the Gator fan. So it, it, it runs through and through. Like I, I dropped my four-year-old off to ESPN's daycare this morning. And, and on her own, she says, Daddy, I sometimes say I like the Cowboys because I like to mess around with you and make you laugh. <laughs> and I was like, that's right, because why? And she's like, Cowboys stink. I said, exactly. So, <laughs> so we have that, that great rapport, and the, and the kids love it. They, they, they are really into, like, the red zone. I'm not sure if you guys watch NFL Sunday because you're probably traveling a lot. Maybe you watch it on the bus. We're, we're, we're we really do. into that. Yeah. And, and we got the eight- and six-year-old into fantasy football, and they were in two leagues last year for the first time, Justin and JR. And my eight-year-old was obsessed with it every single day on the waiver wire. And, and like, just try to make sure to figure everything out. And he won one of the leagues. Oh, no. And, wow. and, oh, man. He was talking so much smack. Oh, oh yeah. It's unbelievable. So He, he um, backed it up. He's, he gets to. Yeah, so he was so sneaky because we did two drafts. And the first draft. I was helping him, and that was in his cousin's league. And I was just basically an advisor to both of them because it was their first year. And I, I kind of stored some rookies away to the side because I knew that we were going to draft them later. So then hours later, we did the neighborhood draft where I had my own team with my six-year-old. And my eight-year-old basically drafted right in front of me and took every guy I had <laughs> in the queue because he had known and realized what I was doing in the first draft. So oh. I, I, I'm cussing them across the, you Sneaky know, we're outside on the deck. Oh gosh. Yeah. And, but at the same time, deep down, uh, I'm really proud of him. Oh yeah. But I, I'm also cussing him cause he's gonna, he's gonna, you know, beat me in this thing. And then he eventually won the league. So uh, wow. it, it's fun. It's really fun to do that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Hey, so, so do they watch you on TV? They or is do. it like embar is embarrassing to them? No, mine, no, they, they watch. Mine are, mine are a little more of the latter. They're like, Dad, why are you on TV? Or, <laughs> you know, like, like so, you know. so they're at the age right now where it's really, it's really cool. Um, the eight year old, I don't tell them to watch, uh, but if I have like a cool interview, I'll shoot a note to my wife. Hey, I've got such and such on. I think the kids will get a kick out of it. You know, that, that's the only reason if they see me interview somebody that, that they know. And my, my eight-year-old is hearing it from his friends now, so he'll come home and, and be be like, "Dad, are you famous?" And I'm like, "No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not famous. I'm your dad. Uh, I will always be your dad." And I'm like, "Why? What's going on?" He's just like, "Uh, never mind." And then like he wrote like this uh this school project last week about why it's cool to work at ESPN, and it, it you can go all to all the games. You can go to the ESPN cafeteria and get candy. Uh, you can interview all these famous people and then you can talk sports and, and he, and he brought it home the project. And I was just like, wow, th this is, this is how he looks at me. My six year old comes, uh, you know, approaches me and says, why do you have to go to work? Can't you stay home at night? Like, like, uh, everybody else. And I'm like, dad's got to work though. And, and 
that's where you hear the bo- – yeah, I'm sure you've heard that on the road. Like while we have a cool job, we're not normal people. We don't work nine to five. Right. There's nothing nine to five about any of us, right? right. Um, so that means we're on the road and, and we're working weekends and working at nights. And some of that time we miss out. So when we're around, we, we go all in and uh, we attack it like we attack work. Make the most of it. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's cool that you get the chance to coach your kids. I mean, yeah. you get the chance to do that right now because you also know down the road that when they look back and you'd be like, dad's on the road. Well, I had some time with them. Right. Yeah. We, we actually did that. We did some like math on that one time and figured out, even though we're gone a lot, when we're home, we're home. So, you know, a lot of people, if you do the math between somebody working a nine to five and this and that, we're actually home more in a whole year's time span than if we were, and then you're attentive. And when you're home, you're off, you know, I mean, you're not getting, you're not coming home tired from work. Well, maybe the first day, but, um, but yeah, it's definitely a different one. And talking about that, Kevin, last week we had Adam Hambrick, who's a, a young up and coming country artist, and he's a great dad. Like you two guys are, uh, I'm dad to Lola, my little sweet pup, but, um, we were talking about great TV dads, and since you guys are both TV dads and talking about being TV dads, we thought we'd run that by and see if we missed anybody off of our Mount Rushmore potential list of TV dads, somebody you might like growing up or even as an adult. Um, I'm going to run down who we had, and you can chime in on, on them, or if you want to add any to it, we'll go that route. All right. Uh, we said last week the ones we had for sure, uh, I had some older ones like Ward Cleaver, uh, Mike Brady, uh, James from Good Times. Uh, you had to put Bill Cosby in there, you know, whatever. You know, and I was like, to- ah, can you, though? Can you really? <laughs> I mean, if it's just for body of work on the show, <laughs> you know, I guess. Uh, and Al Bundy, uh, Carl Winslow, uh, Dan Connor, Andy Griffith, Charles Ingalls, Danny Tanner, uh, and then and Tim the Tool Man Taylor. That's and a good a couple, list. Yeah, and a couple new ones we that – some listeners chimed in with were Ben Cartwright from Bonanza, uh, Uncle Jesse, even though he's uh, their uncle, but Uncle Jesse on Dukes of Hazard, uh, Hank Hill from King of the Hill. Hey, Bobby, oh, yeah. uh, good one, <laughs> and uh, and Uncle Phil from the Fresh Prince. Yes, I was waiting so, for Uncle Phil. That yeah, was, I, was, I can't believe we one. missed him last week. I mean, I mean, Uncle Phil. I mean, he was yeah. everybody's dad for a while. That, that was a great one. Uh, you nailed it, especially when you brought up Uncle Jesse, because the whole time I'm like, yeah, Uncle Phil was the one that really stood out. And, and you know, you mentioned Bill Cosby. We were under a different circumstance, right, uh, yeah. while we were watching that show, uh, right. especially the impact that he had at that time uh, in the 80s. We, we looked at we looked at sitcoms in a completely different light. Um, it's, you know, when you look back at, like, some of the shows that we, we have kindly – currently like processed in the last 20 years it's really hard to i mean like with tony soprano but uh, i don't i don't know if you can say tony soprano, <laughs> yeah right, right yeah i mean yeah, like it's different circumstances right i, I think yeah. the list you guys have really nailed it that's about, um yeah you know because we were talking about the show yellowstone recently and some people oh! were, what about john dutton and i'm like yeah besides the fact that he kills people every <laughs> about every other day you know he's, you know he's, what I mean, I, you but know? we can say on that show casey's actually a good dad Casey's right? a he good is. dad. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I th- I, yeah. Deep down, he he is absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like, still a, still a murderer. He's good with. But yeah. <laughs> still yeah. a murderer. No, no, no. One hundred percent. Like like I, I went on a Yellowstone kick, guys, three weeks ago, and I watched the entire three seasons in a nine days. Same I just here. like I was just consuming it every single night. I couldn't stop. Yep. And um, that that's a phenomenal show. It feels like The Sopranos out in the Midwest when you look at like the the players that are involved, right? And there's like yeah, a, light, a, a mob feel, right? It's I like, like ca- it. cow- cowboy gangsters or something. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I liked totally. it, but it just seemed just the killing was just so much. The first season, I was like, "There's no way national news wouldn't know if 30 people died in a week in this <laughs> little part of Montana." Yeah, but, yeah. I noticed they, that with season two. Season two uh, also had a lot of murder, and then and then I noticed in season three, in the beginning, they were trying to soften everybody up. It, yeah, and again, that helps because I, I just watched everything on a binge. But That's I was insane. like, "Wow, season three is a little bit different because season yeah. two yeah. was hardcore at the end." Yeah, and then they bring in and then they bring in the terrorist mob stuff to blow everybody. I mean, it just got so crazy at the end. Yeah, hey, I tell you, a, a new a new sports when I just did the same thing in binge because it was on my flight last week uh, to go out and do some work. 
uh, and started was it's on uh, Apple Plus. Uh, Tom La- Tom Lazo about the uh, f- it's Ted Lazo. Ted Lazo about the American football coach that goes to uh, London and coaches a soccer team. Pretty so, f- pretty funny show. I'm embarrassed uh, that I've yet to watch it. Every and Jr. Uh, Justin, I don't know if you've seen it. Jr. Every single person. I've talked to raves about it. We were in commercial break yesterday on Sports Center. My co-anchor, L. Duncan, and I were talking about recent shows and stuff. And, and she brought up, she's like, yeah, I've got to watch Ted Lasso. And the whole set, like the, uh, the camera people, the audio person, they all, the producer, they all chimed in. And like, oh, you've got to watch it. It's like the same reaction. Did you feel the same way? Like you love the show? Yeah, absolutely. It, as soon as it kicked off, it, it's, a, it's a take. I tell you what it is. It's a take on uh, Major League. The whole premise of Major League, the the movie from back in the day, Tom Berenger, um, and I, so it, it's I a take even on heard that. of it. Oh yeah, it, I just I randomly did it. Won a bunch of Emmys last year and stuff. Yeah. It was it's on Apple TV. But yeah, Tom Lazo or Ted Lazo, he's a Division two coach, wins a championship uh, in America. The soccer coach over there or the team over there needs a new coach. They bring him over. It's the the wife of the ex owner. Anyway, but it's it's basically the um, they're trying to bring the team down but it does the opposite because he's so funny but he's a midwestern wow. guy from kansas and uh it's really funny it was it, it was really good it's jason yeah. sudeikis and i think uh the golden globes um were like two weeks ago and i i heard he just won literally i i could i have i may have the wrong I, award show i no, think I, he he like yeah. swept everything and everybody wow. was raving about it on my twitter timeline yeah, I haven't yeah, even watched it. It's good, and it's not it's not vulgar. It's it's family friendly. It's it's I mean it's a little racy here and there, but it's funny. It's it's real good. Yeah. I definitely right. uh, that's oh, next in the queue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, Kev, I know and he's we a good got dad you. as well. He's got a little boy back home talking about being gone. What maybe think of that his little boy's still in America and he's over there coaching. So they're doing the stuff like we do on the road and trying to FaceTime. So. I know, I, I know, I know. You got a lot more important things going on, and we don't have you for long. But it, really quick, I just want to ask you a couple things. How did you get into journalism? Was it especially sports broadcasting? Was it? Were you an athlete growing up, and then, or did you just love sports, or did you love journalism? Just yeah. it, it quickly. I, it, so, how, how you? Um, how did you wind up on Sports Center? You know what I mean. People are going, "Golly, that's the coolest job ever." So and on the, the Justin Moore podcast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and the Cliff Notes version of this is um, I, I remember I wanted to become an architect. And I remember my uh, guidance counselor in ninth grade was like, take this building construction class and then you'll get an idea of how to kind of design things. And I remember my first week in this class, I hated everything about it. I was like, I've got a full full year in this class. What the hell am I doing? I need to get out of this class. That's a so, lot of math that I can't yeah, do. That is a lot. Uh, exactly. I was like, wait a second, numbers? I just want to draw. Yeah. And, um, and then later on, a few months later, I was watching a college basketball game. And I'll never forget where I was in the living room at my house. And they were profiling this guy at the free throw line. And the announcers specifically said, yeah, he wants to do what we do. He wants our job. And at that moment, I was like, wait a second, you get paid to do this? You can travel and call games? And that night, and I, I would watch Sports Center at night. I'd watch in the morning. I'd watch the reruns. I consumed everything about Sports Center. As a ninth grader, that night I watched Sports Center, and I'm not kidding. I was 14 years old. I specifically said out loud, "I want to be the first Indian American on Sports Center." And I just said it. I was like, "That's what I wow. want to do." And then um, I was like, "All right, what am I going to do? I got to figure this out because uh, no one uh, that looks like me's been on TV to talk sports." Uh, when, when this was like the late 80s, early 90s, and then um, I went to school. I did every single internship possible. Um, I got involved, and then my first job was Kirksville, Missouri, in Market 199, and uh, it was uh, 13 months there. Phenomenal experience. The people were so kind to me. I learned a hell of a lot. My first live shot was at a rodeo, and my first line was, I, I'm surrounded by cowboys, and I'm the only Indian, and uh, <laughs> it, worked out, it worked out really well. Um, that's great. So we, we had a blast. Uh, and then my next job was in Sarasota, Florida. I was there for three years and I actually got out of TV, had to take care of some things, uh, with my family. Um, and that was my priority. So against my parents' wishes, I went back to the Philadelphia area and lived with my mom and worked for my dad in my late twenties. And they were really ticked off that I left TV, but it was important that I, I stayed at home to take care of some family, uh, business. 
And um, a year later, my old TV station called me up. And I was dating a girl at the time down there in Florida. And they were like, well, we want you back. Uh, have you reconsidered? Have things changed? Uh, we'll, we'll give you a promotion. You'll run the department. We got everything here. It was on the beach. And I went back to my mom and I told my mom, I said, things have settled down. Can I, you know, can I get back into this? And she's like, yeah, get the hell out of here. In the meantime, I had started my own entertainment company and I was selling uh, drugs as a pharmaceutical sales rep to make money. Um, so I went in my late twenties back to Sarasota and I was there for two and a half years. I stumbled upon somebody, um, who is now a dear friend of mine. And she was like, what are you doing here? I said, what do you mean? She was in TV. She's like, you need to be somewhere else. You need to, you need to get with an agent. I had dealt with an agent before and I was like, I, I, I'm not dealing with an agent. And she was like, just talk to him. Give him, give him like two minutes of your time. Call the agent up. He's in New York. He said, listen, I saw. 10 seconds of your tape, Kev, handshake agreement. If I get you a job in the next six months at a regional network or network TV, we got a deal. If not, we walk away. And now the girl I was down there seeing, I was no longer with her. I was now dating my wife. She was in TV as well. Um, she was a, um, a reporter. So her and I talked about it and I was like, what do I got to lose? ESPN, you know, uh, is still my dream. So that guy in three months, that agent got me a tryout at ESPN. Called me up, said, you want to go up there competing against set, six other people. You audition, you fly up there, you go on set, you do 10 minutes, you, you do all these interviews. And I told, uh, you know, my soon-to-be wife, what do I got to lose, right? Uh, let me. It's on ESPN's dime. I get to see the campus. If they don't like me, they don't like me. But, shoot, this is still a dream. dream yeah, come one true. step closer to the dream, yeah. Exactly. I went up there. I nailed the, the tryout. And I nailed the interviews. Chris Berman walked in the middle of one of my interviews, which was like, okay, this is, this is a sign. Um, and then I, I flew back home and I had to wait and I waited for three weeks. And, um, I told, I told Monica, I was like, listen, if I don't get the job, I'm at peace because I thought I kicked ass in the, uh, in the audition and the interviews. So that means somebody's better than me. And I'm okay with that because I was, I was pretty damn good. And then I got the call three weeks later and they were like, you ready to come up here? And I was like, uh, I still got, I got four more years left of my contract. I went in my boss's, uh, office the next day and she was like, I'll rip it up. She's like, no one's ever made a jump to ESPN. And then boom, that was 2006. So I've been at the network wow. for uh, close to 15 years. It's crazy. Well, wow. and correct me if I'm wrong, but you did become the first of Indian descent yeah. to be on there. Correct. I was. Which, so 17 years later, I was the first Indian American at ESPN, first on the air, first one to do Sports Center a year and a half later. So wow. it, it's pretty wild. It's incredible, and, and, man. It, it goes back to one of those things I really believe that it, it, if you believe in yourself, and, and honestly, if sometimes you put things out in the universe um, you and, and you just bust your butt, you're there for opportunity, somehow, some way, it'll find you. Hey, speaking into existence. Hey, you said something that made me. Uh, it made me think of a question when you were in ninth grade and you said that to yourself i want to be the first of indian descent to be on sports center or espn uh do you remember who the anchors were no uh i literally have no idea but i would imagine on those sunday nights or those nights i was watching it was usually chris Berman. And which yeah. was again like a full circle thing right. uh, with with Boomer and, and some of the stuff and some of the people that I've, I've I've met through the years and then you find yourself on the set with these guys and you're like holy crap like and great Stuart friends Scott's with world, probably right? yes oh yeah, and, yeah you know Boomer pulled me to the side Justin and you could appreciate this you, you look up to these guys yes exactly he pulled me to the side one night on his own and he just said I Kev I just want to let you know that back in the day. Um, when the guys were running everything around here, the old school guys, in the sense, the Bermans and, and the Keith Obermans and the Dan Patricks and the Linda Cones and the Robert Roberts. He was like, when, when we were there back in the day, you could have hung with us. You could have rolled with us and been part wow. of this group. And I was just like, holy crap. You know, that's like being uh, that's like being told you could have been on SNL with Chevy Chase and and the, and yeah. and Belushi and those guys, you know. Exactly. So it was pretty cool. humbling, and and it was one of those moments you walk away and I'm saying I, I don't know how to top that. That was pretty damn awesome. Um, and I just gonna put my head down and continue to work. You know. Yeah. Well, hey, w one because uh, we haven't got to hang and catch up in a long time, and it's great to see you and talk to you. 
but uh, two because I know you you got to run. Um, but I just have one more quick question for you. Course, favorite athlete, of, favorite athlete of all time, any sport. Woo! Yeah. Not Bo not bad, not best, but favorite. Bo Jackson, without a doubt. Actually, I'll take you here, in my uh, stud. So I had the chance to meet Bo a couple of times, and uh, this is like obviously the iconic picture yeah. of him. Uh, and then this is me and Bo. Uh, outside our studio in Sports Center, after me and him did an interview, and Love nicest guy in the wow. world, nicest wow. guy. In the, uh, and at the same time, like I always wanted to be Bo. I think if he was healthy, he would have been the greatest, uh, greatest athlete of all time, uh, considering his strength and power as a football player and what he could do with a baseball bat was insane. So that yeah. that that's my guy. That will always it, be my guy. And Bo Bo was the guy who never even worked out, right? Yeah, no. he, shot, he <laughs> shot his bow. He, yes. he shot. He shot his bow. I mean, that was his. That was his training. crazy. He's a freak crazy. of nature, man. Yeah. Hey, like, he's an absolute freak. No doubt. Hey, speaking of, I got one quick too uh, as well. The Eagles this year. Jalen Hurts, my boy. Jalen Hurts going to be your guy. I hope so. He deserves it. Uh, I like Jalen a lot. I actually think Jalen's a mini Nick Saban. He's like Nick Saban, the the, the player, right? Yeah. Um, we're the same way. Like you were saying about Andy Reid, we we've pulled for Jalen ever since. You know when he went to Oklahoma. No, we love Jalen here. He couldn't do no wrong in Alabama. Jr. Sure. He's all class. Good. He's a good kid. I say kid because he's twenty years younger than me. Um, yeah. and he's straight business, and and he deserves a legitimate chance. Uh, I I hope that they give him an opportunity this season. They surround him with some talent uh, when it comes to wide receivers, and then just say, all right, let's see what what he can do because he showed flashes. Um. And uh, this is the way the NFL is going to be. You've got to be able to move around like the Russell Wilsons, the Deshaun Watsons, the Patrick Mahomes and the, the Josh Allens. If you move around in the pocket, move, you know, manipulate the pocket, it'll open up opportunities down the field. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I know I we got to get you out of here. One thing we do on here is we get our guest, and you've got a birthday actually coming up here in a few weeks. We do uh, the number one country music song on the day you were born. Oh, and, nice. Yeah. Justin's is um, Alabama's Roll On 18 Wheeler. Uh, mine is Conway Twitty's I May Never Go to Heaven. And. The, do you want to take a wild guess on what the number one song in the country was? And this is neat because it's a favorite song of our mutual friend, Mr. Joey Gonzalez, from our management office. Oh, wait, we're talking about 1975, too, right? Correct. March 20th, 75, the number one country music song in the country that week. I, I have no idea. It would be nothing but Before the Next Teardrop Falls by Mr. Freddie Fender. Oh, uh, Freddie course. Fender! And that's, and, that's Joey's, cool. and that's Joey G's favorite singer and song. We listen to that every time yeah. he's on the bus. And, and for those out there, yeah, for those for out sure. there listening and watching, Joey is how Kevin and the two of us met, their yep. friendship. So that's rather fitting. That's, so, very yeah. much that's so. pretty amazing. And you know what? Here's, here's the great thing for the audience. My connection to Joey is because of Marty Smith. So it all comes full circle, right? There you go. Like yep. uh, Marty and I met – well, Marty knows Joey. I met – uh, Joey, while I was having dinner with Marty before a college football game, and then that led me to you guys. So it, it, we're there all full circle here in the conversation. I love hey, it. Hey, man, it's great to talk to you. We'll get you out of here with this. The, we talked about March Madness a little bit when we first came on. To me, it feels like there are 15 teams in the country who can win the national championship this year because I don't – if you want to put Baylor and Gonzaga a little bit ahead of everybody else, then I'm fine with that. But uh, it feels like to me there's there's more parity uh, mm -hmm. in the national landscape than ever. What's your thoughts on uh, March Madness, how it's going to play out? And Justin, do you agree you or it. disagree with me? 100% you nailed it. Yeah, you know the sport. Uh, there's a lot of parity, especially this year. And when you don't have the Blue Bloods uh, dominating the conversation like Kentucky and Duke and North Carolina – uh, even Michigan State, uh, I, I think that not having a full year and and having that that I think those controlled practices with freshmen when you're bringing in so much talent, so it, you're relying on specifically uh, leadership from veterans and guard play. And I come back to one thing: I think Baylor defensively and the guards that they have. It's a completely different story in the tournament. When you got to win six games and go through everything, I really like Baylor. Gonzaga can score a lot of points when you look at them, but I, I like Baylor's toughness at the guard play. I will say this. It's not because I'm on, on this show with you guys. I do believe both Arkansas and Alabama are sweet 16 teams, and one of them will make it to the Elite Eight. Wow. I, I, I will take do. it. 
I believe I'll it. Sign, so. I'll sign up for it right now. Here, my thoughts: if if in the tournament, it comes down to can you defend? Yep. Defense, defensive rebound, and can you get the ball where you want it to who you want to get it to? Value and possession. One hundred percent. And that and, comes and down to, as you said, moments. guard guard play. You yes, I, mean? I, I want to see how deal. Moody handles the moment because I think he's yeah. going to be really, really good in these type of games, right? And on the other side, Petty's got to step up for Alabama. When Petty plays well, Bama plays well. They love to shoot the threes. If they can get hot in the tournament from three, watch out for Bama. But also, I can't wait to watch how, how Arkansas plays big yeah. picture-wise. I'm yeah. pumped hey, up for both you guys. Both only a handful man. of teams have won eight, nine, ten games in a row all year. You know, that's what it takes in the tournament. you got to win five or six in a row. I mean, that's tough. So Exactly. Uh, exactly. Hey, you guys, uh, honestly, this has been a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, and I'm thanks, glad man. Joey reached out. He's a good man, and it's good seeing you guys. Uh, so when are you hey. coming up north? Because we got to hang. Hopefully soon, man. Well, you know, we 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 tend to take less casualties each day to our schedule, so it seems like better news each and every week. So hopefully sooner rather than later. And Kevin, in all seriousness, man, uh, we have a ton of respect for you as as uh, as a professional, but more so as a human being. And I know you have a hundred different things you could be doing right now. And for you to take the time to do this, man, I I'd sincerely appreciate it. Justin, it's my pleasure, man. This was a blast, man. A lot of I appreciate fun. you guys reaching out. Man, stay safe more than anything else. Yeah, tell your wife, to... tell your wife what? hello and whoop pig. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll Should get be you. Doing this, right? Oh yeah. No. yeah, we'll have to get you back on in a few months. And we'll we'll recap the whole tournament and all that stuff in a couple of months or something. You got it, Jr. Best of luck, right. you guys. I'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate you, Kevin. There he was, ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Nagandi from ESPN. How awesome was that, man? That's our second ESPN guy. Uh, Marty Smith, who he talked about, is an, a, another mutual friend. And uh, Kevin, we met, yeah. Kevin we met years ago, and we thought it would be fun to have him on with the beginning of March Madness. We didn't even mention Alabama and Arkansas, but they are two of the hottest teams, not only in the SEC but the country. And So that was exciting to hear from a national – that's a national perspective. We yeah. know what you we know what we get from a local and regional perspective, but to to hear that uh, unsolicited from a, a national perspective is exciting and uh, happy to to know that he agrees with me that it it's kind of a wide open uh, field as far as the NCAA tournament goes. So uh, what a great guy! I mean, really great guy. I feel like I say the same thing about each guest we get on, but I, I genuinely believe it. To be true, um, he's a, a super nice guy and uh, incredibly talented, and his story is really cool. Wish we could have dove deeper into it, but next time we get him on, maybe we can do that. Yeah, for sure, man. That was great. Yeah, it, it's. Uh, I didn't even get to go in. I wanted to get some John Chaney stories from him. Being I, a I, Temple I, I came Owl, this close, know? but I, I knew we, we had a clock. I had a yeah. clock going in my mind. So yeah, so I know he had he had a ton of stuff going on uh, this week. So we want to thank him for calling. Oh, just, just a oh, just hosting Sports Center. I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. You're like, right. <laughs> just breaking down the entire NFL for everyone and college basketball and everything else. Pretty much broke it down for us today, which was awesome. That's some inside stuff you're not going to get everywhere when you get, like you said, a national anchor like that to just chop it up about you know our sports and just what he really thinks off the cuff and. Um, so that was great. Great Kevin DeGandhi. Thank you, brother. We appreciate that. And I definitely want to get him back on uh, after, you know, when, maybe when NFL season kicks off because that's, that's his that's his go-to. We can talk about pro sports. But, uh, but yeah, you yeah. want to take a quick break, Just, and, uh, for Let's station identification and give a shout-out to all of our lovely sponsors out there. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll come back here in just a few and wrap this thing up. Absolutely. Let's do it. All right, guys. Stay thank you all. Y'all stay tuned, and uh, we'll be right back here on the Justin Moore Podcast. Hey guys, today's podcast is sponsored by Bobcat Company, who has blown me away with the amount of cool and useful equipment that they offer. You know Bobcat for their loaders, right? They are the ones who invented the skid steer 60 plus years ago, and today they make a Toolcat utility work machine, zero turn mowers, I need one of those, compact tractors, I need one of those too and a ton of other cool stuff that makes it easy and a lot of fun to get work done around your property. Check them out at bobcat.com. Hey, everybody, want to let you know that today's podcast is brought to you by Founders Brewing Company. 
Uh, they got an awesome Founders All Day IPA. I got to be honest, I don't love IPAs, but I do love the All Day IPA from Founders Brewing Company. Um, it's clean, it's crisp, it drinks like a light beer, to be honest with you, but it's full of flavor. So go check it out. Founders All Day IPA, Founders Brewing Company. All right, welcome back, everyone, to the Justin Moore Podcast. I want to say thanks again to our buddy Kevin Nagandi from ESPN for jumping on and chopping it up about some sports with us and uh, TV dads and some some just cool backstory on him. I want to say thanks again to last week's uh, guest, Adam Hambrick, for coming on. And I noticed, Justin, I saw an article somebody had picked up um, – uh, you talking about the or Adam and you talking about the Rascal Flats cut that was pretty funny. Uh, Want to give a shout out to those guys, Whiskey Riff in the house. You did their podcast a while back, didn't you, Jess? I did. It was a lot of fun. Those guys are 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 uh, <laughs> they, they remind me of me like ten years ago. They're, yeah, they're just, they're just lounge time. chair drinking beer. I love it. Yeah, but uh, really good good guys and really talented guys and and what they've done with with that brand and podcast and online presence is uh is pretty neat it's pretty yeah, neat to see no doubt bunch of good big things country like that fans out. yeah no doubt no doubt so appreciate those guys just want to give them a quick shout out uh i had you know you said last week just you were talking about uh, you were talking to adam about having the blowout and you were saying a, 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 something to know about being on the road was having your impact wrench with you having something you could get your lug nuts off and get your tire chains faster if you got in a bind and i thought of something uh we could do you know a, a segment here from time to time uh, that involved being out on the road. And it was uh, just something I thought about because I'm usually angry when I'm driving because I feel like no one else knows how to properly drive. So I wanted to bring something to the – it's the Justin Moore Podcast Driving Tips with Justin I, and JR. I, I, I want to change the name. Okay, bring it. Um, it's the Justin Moore Podcast. You suck at driving. Here's some tips. Yeah. Okay, there we go. <laughs> we, we got more letters to write it out. Yeah, you suck at driving, so here are some tips. Uh, you know, I, I'm trying to think of the ones I had. You know, the uh, the first one that comes to mind that happened lately when I've been traveling long distance that really gets me, and, and I love these guys and gals who do this as a profession, and so I'm not throwing any shade their way. I just don't comprehend the concept. Are you not paying attention? Do you not care? Are you doing it out of spite? When two 18-wheelers are back-to-back, -back, one in front of the other, and there's cars coming up. The back, the 18 wheeler behind, the second 18 wheeler pulls over in the passing lane like it's going to pass, yet never passes. Goes 10 miles under the speed limit the entire time so no one can get around, and then eventually just tucks back into the, the truck they were following anyway. Just don't understand that one. I have to say, if you're in the left lane, your job is to be passing someone. If you're going under the speed limit, there is never a time to be in the left lane. If you're going to pass somebody, get on around them. Don't him haw and don't be texting. Half the time, that's it. You wonder why they're and then they pay attention. They realize they're texting and not driving. And that's another one there too. If you're going to text and drive, set your damn cruise control. No, he, no, uh, not to contradict you, but don't text and drive. <laughs> yeah, if Just you don't suck do at it. it, if you're great at it, then okay. I could, you know, if you, but if you definitely, if you suck at it, do not do that. <sighs> I, I will say I don't do very – I don't. there's not a lot of things I do well uh, from a um, – from the standpoint of, of uh, holding myself back and being uh, – what's the word I'm looking for here, JR? Um, it would be like a saving word, like discipline. I don't, there's not – I'm not very disciplined at a lot of things, but I – I can honest to God put my hand on a Bible and say I never text and drive. The only time I do it is through my voice text because it pops up on my truck speaker and they'll go, do you want to reply? Yes. And then I say it, send. That's it. Just don't yeah. do it. Period. Don't do it. It's, it's dangerous. And you see so many people, truckers, regular people, everybody. When I, I've, I've driven back, you know, a couple of long drives in the last month or two, and you see everyone texting and driving. And it's so obvious, too, because you're in the lane, you're going slower than you should, you're jerking every now and then trying to keep it between the ditches. And I'm just like, would somebody get these people? It's so obvious. And you're going to have a wreck and not paying attention. You know, um, I just don't get it. I guess that's well, part of my driving tips. I just don't understand how – I'm so with you. Like my my deal, my biggest pet peeve is 
being in the left lane, not passing somebody. Here's what I do on the interstate. Let's, let's just talk just interstates here. And I'm not perfect, certainly, by any stretch of the imagination at driving or anything else. But what I do, I set my cruise control on whatever it is. Yep. Say 75, okay? And I'm in the right lane. If I'm coming up on a car that clearly I'm going to pass, I put my blinker on, I change lanes, and then immediately, once I get past that vehicle, I get back in the right lane. Yep. The left lane is literally only to pass. To it's pass. not to stay in. No. It's to pass. That's now, it. If, and, if the, and if you're passing one and there's another vehicle ahead of it that you know you're going to pass as well, I approve staying. Even because, And I know I've pissed if it, a few if people. It's clo- if it's close enough. If but I if don't, it's yeah. a mile down the road, right, you'll right. want to get back if it's in the close right enough. lane. And if it's close enough and I don't think I'm going to get stuck in between them again with a long line of cars. But, yeah, basically right. I, I'm never going to be in the left lane going slower than the person in the right lane. I'm trying to pass somebody. Might not be as fast as somebody behind me wants me to pass them. Because I'm like you. I use my cruise control in the interstate. It just Period. makes so much sense. Just set the cruise control. Most all modern vehicles have a cruise control. Yeah. And, t- and the other thing is, I guess to put it more simply, is – if you have to stay in the left lane, as long as you're not holding anybody up, but be co- be cognizant of the fact that there's somebody behind me trying to get around me. If there's somebody comes up behind you, get over. You can get always over. get over. Yeah. Well, that goes back to paying attention. I don't think people are paying attention half the time. And the other thing is, and this is a law in Arkansas, and I'm assuming pretty much anywhere, but if there's a car in the right lane pulled over, and you can get over into the left lane so you're not going right beside them because it's dangerous. Dangerous. So I, it That's has to be a another thing law. that people don't know. People, it, just, people just whip by people, and they're to, out there trying to change a tire or yeah. do whatever. And or I'm police like, pulling over. somebody over or you know, yes. a, a wrecker or something. It's, yeah, get over in the left lane. Let somebody over if you can. But, be, but do it ahead of time. Man, a big thing would be look down the road a little ways. Know what's coming up on you before you get there. Try to be – just pay attention because I see that too. I'll get over. I'll slow down, get over. Most of us get – then somebody comes right by us in the right lane flying by whoever's on the side of the road on the shoulder trying to f- address whatever problem they have. And I'm, I think the same thing. I'm like, that's illegal. Some, that's who needs to be pulled over. That's, that's going to get somebody hurt. That's going to sling a rod. It's, it's just why would you do that? If it's you on the side of the road, you wouldn't want somebody to do that. I say a lot of this is just the golden rule. You know, would you want somebody yeah. flying by you there if you're you on the side of the rope? No. So don't do it. Well, the you other, know? the, the other, and it, the, go ahead. You know, now, the other pet peeve I have is it, let's say two lanes go into one lane and you know that it's coming. You know, yep. like, okay, get over as soon as you possibly can. Do not fly by me in the right lane if we're going over into the left lane and we're sitting in a line of traffic to get through this road work yeah. and try to sneak in up at the front. Yeah. A- F you. Yeah, I unless am not let, I am not letting you in. Now, if you get in like way back, I'll let you in. Yeah, you ain't whipping by me up to the front of the line and get in. No, screw you. No, and and I say this: this goes with that. Also, with the speeding thing, when somebody's tailgating you, you know I'm gonna let you get around. If you have an emergency and you really got to get by somebody, use your flashers. Put your flashers on. if you, Because if I'm in a bind, I'm putting my flashers on to let you know I need to get around. I have an emergency. If you're coming up on me doing 100 on the interstate, hit your flashers. I'll see you in my rearview mirror. I'll get out of your way. You don't have to get on my butt. Because hey, if I gotta, the flashers indicate you have an emergency or a situation you need to address. So I'm going to get out of your way. That's what hey, lets got, me know that. If I if I got a sling a deuce bad enough, I'm using my flashers. Exactly, <laughs> but that's the that's what they're for. Let you know I've got a I gotta go. I've got a problem. I've got to get this handled. You know, uh, just that that kills me. I think a lot of it too is they need to be more stringent on these driver tests. I don't think people. I don't think some people even know that you're supposed to get over and that you shouldn't ride the left lane. I'm sure it's in a book, but I think they let. I'm sure I skim by too, but I think we need to be a little stricter on these driving tests. I think that would solve a lot of our problems, or or, or maybe you have to re you know, retake a small test at some point in your life. I got my driver's license in, what, 1995? And I've never been questioned about how I could drive since then. I go in, they check my eyes and make sure I could pay the whatever money. That's really all that's required to get one since then. They don't know if I'm just I got, a I got mine in nine, I got mine in 98. Yeah. 
So it's like yeah. and you've never and we've never had to do anything else to have a driver's license since then. No, but we're good. I know we're, that's not, a, we're not worried about us. <laughs> no, but I know. But I'm just saying we pay attention because we would be able to pass any test you throw at me about driving. Uh, you know, any normal test because I know. You know, another one I think about, and I have to do this all the time, and I feel like that commercial they show where it's like, don't become your parents, you know, don't be talking to random, don't help people back up, you know, you don't need the sign that says live, laugh, love, we don't need that sign. <laughs> There's that commercial, and I think about, I don't. I try not to be that guy that talks to people, but I notice all the time somebody has a taillight or a headlight out, and I'll try to pull up beside them and let them know, hey, you got a tail light out or, hey, your headlight's out. Because if you don't know, you just don't know, you know, if you don't go check. So that would be a great tip. Every now and then, just go check your lights. Make sure your brake lights work. Make sure your headlight works. If your brake light's cracked and it shoots white light out the back, I'm going to think that's a headlight. So it needs it has to be red over it. If you've got a headlight out, I'm going to think it's a motorcycle at night. So – Check your headlights and your tail lights and your brake lights from time to time because and I see people ride around. I had to stop one of the uh, like the shuttle buses for one of the resorts here in, in Gulf Shores recently. I followed him up to where he was going. I said, "Hey, buddy, just to let you know you don't have any light. Your headlights are on, but you got no back lights in this big bus at night." You know, I was, he's like, "Oh, thanks." You know, you just, yeah. You gotta well, get them you, on. Oh, here's another tip as far as lights go: uh, turn them on turn when them it's on. dark. Yeah, turn and when on, it's raining. Sure. Yeah, you see, how many people yeah, do you see going like, through with their street lights and it's dark and they don't have their lights on? It's they have crazy. Their day, they have the day. See, what they do is now most modern cars have those daytime running lights. You have some headlights, but they're not your main headlights. So you may think you have light on, but you don't. You got to have it on automatic or just turn them on if it gets dark. Double check. Yep. So anyway, well, there's uh, you <laughs> I don't suck know at what driving. That section was, but. yeah, the driving. The, the it could almost be like grinds our gears. You know what grinds our gears? That's one of them. Bad drivers out there. Yeah, we, and we 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 developed that because we don't have a shocker for this week. We'll have that. We'll have that segment back next week. Yeah, uh, yeah, not but, a big uh, shocker here. Everybody hates a crappy driver. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, but um, the other thing I want to touch on, Jr is so you and i are both watching the crown yes did you see all the hoopla about the interview with oprah yes saw it this i mean it was like watching the crown and i haven't watched this interview but i've i've read excerpts from it i mean it is spot on spot on yeah right yeah it's yeah it's spot on and i don't know if that's because we've watched so much crown or what but it's just just definitely something it, but it seems like just a scene right out of the crown i'm not up to i'm still in the old days i'm still in the you know 60s i think so i'm not even to that part of the crown yeah yet. we're in the we're in season two still but yeah i'm just like exactly what i told you and i've been telling kate is like this whole thing is so silly because yeah. the other thing is they have zero political power they just have political influence so, what exactly are they carrying on this charade for? I don't well, get it. Well, it's just and almost, why are tax dollars going to make them richer? Yeah, like well, I don't it, like if I'm if I'm living over there, like I'm going, why the hell should I care about these people? Yeah, they're horrible. They're racist. I mean, allegedly, they're they're just not nice people. Like they care about a symbol. They care about the symbol of a crown more than they do human beings. Like, yeah. what? Why? It's uh, yeah. It's definitely so, it's strange. I think it's just old time. I, you know, it's just uh, it's it's evolution in front of us. It's you know, the old monarchy, imperialism stuff slowly disappearing. I mean, we're watching things in front of us in our lifetime. I'd see, to me, it seems like the lack of evolution. Well, it's changing. Oh yeah, there. You know, you think about that show. There was no. You know, they had all the power. I mean, you know, over hundreds of years, thousands of years or whatever, you know, it was a time when that that was absolute. You know, they there was a time where the sun never set on the British Empire. You know, they had so many, they had colonies all over the world. But that's just how the world was back then. Every country, you know, that could go take over other land 
and resources and all that's what they did i mean that was you know olden days we're in a modern world now so i it's like in that show you know and even in early seasons you know it's like they need to get up with the times you know you kind of got to get with i mean things change we talked about this with pete the other week um you know in our lives we've seen things change and we're all naive to think that everything's going to stay exactly how it was when we were kids i mean our grandparents rode in horse and buggies you know what I mean? So it's like now we yeah. fly around on airplanes. So it's things change. It takes it takes a while, but if you live, stay around this earth long enough, you'll see some of them. So uh, it, just, it just seems as though they're way behind. Yeah, the progress that the rest of the world has made. Well, not, yeah, some of the of world. That. I mean, there's still places in this world though where it's like warlords and stuff. I mean, this world. Yeah, I mean, that's I, true. We that's live in true. we live in a well, we live in a bubble here in America that you know, and we, we catch and we catch hell. Yeah. But like, I'm like, well, we don't have like a family that's just better than everybody else here. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I don't. Anyway, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's so, uh, it's, it's so it's bizarre to me, and bizarre. It, it, just, it angers me for you and I are both very close to our family, and behind or right below God. Family is the most important thing in the world. Yep. Over music, over anything. And the fact that they don't view it that way is just mind blowing to me. It's it's the crown and then family. Right. Like my sister, my brother, my mother, father, son, daughter. They don't come first. The crown comes first. It's right. cr- it's insanity to me. Yeah, you know, it, it, I know, and we're go- I'm going to get bashed for this too. But it's just because I don't understand it. But like yeah, that, that's even like with a lot of those that stuff that happens over, like the old Roman stuff, like the Roman Catholic Church, you know, with the Pope, and 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 all of the, how that works. They have their own city and country and resources, and I mean, it's uh, just uh, it's just I don't understand the, all that how that works over in Europe, but you know that stuff just been around for. We have old things here in America that are five hundred years old at at the oldest, and they've got stuff over there that's like five thousand years old. So I think it's uh, a lot of stuff changing and just stuff I don't know about. But it's definitely uh, it's peculiar, it's peculiar for us for sure here in America because yeah. we we just don't know how all that works, you know. But the rest of the world is a big, wild, crazy place. You got places like. You know, in Japan and, and uh, Abu Dhabi and all those places that's just um, uh, where, like Fight Island where they do the MMA fights and this just crazy, modern, crazy stuff. And then you've got, like I said, warlords and people out and, you know, still living in huts and trying to find water. You know, the pygmies yeah. in the Congo. Uh, shout out to Justin Rents for uh, Fight for the Forgotten and those guys trying to get some uh, wells built for them. Y'all look into that. That's huge but uh but yeah just a crazy world out there man god bless america glad to be here it's and it's nutty here too we got our own set of set of issues i guess like the old song mo money mo problems um but uh but yeah well yes that was an interesting so, dive into dive into that but yeah that definitely I'm, I'm interested to see how that plays out do they i mean because you know in the movie they have controlled things and it's in it's you know in england and now this is they're over here now and well, and the other thing is, um, I, I was telling Kate uh, yesterday, we were talking about it, because she goes, did you watch that? And I, again, I haven't watched it, but I did hear about it, listen to uh, some excerpts and read. And um, I said, boy, uh, not to give anything away, so uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't watched any of The Crown yet and you care to, um, this doesn't give away the show, but a, a piece of it. Um, the brother who gave up the crown to move out, and he was basically exiled. Um, I hope they never want to go back because they're they're dunsky. I yeah. mean, it's over. Forget that. Yeah. But uh, but I I really honestly I have a ton of respect for for uh, both of them for leading their own lives. You know. Yeah. And I think because what the- they're they're completely cut off. They get no money. And and what's weird is Kate was going, well, does the do the brothers still talk? Are they still close? It'd be like, you know, you and Jamie and one of y'all deciding to leave and one of you deciding to stay and play the game. Like, do y'all still talk? Are you still friends? Are you still close? Do you hate each other? Do, does one resent the other? Or 
I mean, I don't yeah. know. I mean, it, it's 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 got to be a strange dynamic. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, and I know we've got some listeners from across the pond, so y'all chime in and uh, let us know how how. Yeah, and let us over. know if we're crazy because we think the yeah. whole thing's crazy. Or I and, and and I don't mean it in a derogatory fashion. I guess maybe I'm coming from an uneducated standpoint, but yeah. it just seems so insignificant to me when there's literally zero political power and it's just kind of people playing a part that does that part need to be played i I don't know i mean what does it do i guess is other than it being a ritual or other than it being customary like what does it do to help your nation yeah I, i don't know i mean I think I think a lot of it's probably music. I don't think they have great music over there. I think they need better country music. I think, I think that's so. why I think I, we need to go over there. I think so. Or or I don't know. Or maybe we need to stay here and play for the the couple that moved back home. They know what's up. They got back over here to America where we got the good stuff. So anyway, shout out to everybody across the pond, all over the world, whoever's listening to the Justin Moore podcast. We appreciate each and every one of y'all. We love everybody. Just putting that out there. If you talk to me or Just on, if y'all know us in real person, y'all know us. We love everybody. We appreciate y'all and. Uh, yeah, we just want everybody to be happy and healthy, man. That's it. Everybody wants the same thing. So, uh, you yeah, know, we no doubt about it. We didn't talk if, a whole lot about music today, but we're actually going to be making some soon. This weekend, as this as this podcast airs, we're going to be playing in uh, down near the Orlando area. We're going to be playing in Dothan, the, Alabama, and Sanford at, at the Sanford, barn. Yeah, at Dothan the barn. at the at the plant. Yep, I believe, and then the world famous uh, Florida. And uh, so, yeah, we're looking forward to that. Uh, we'll be coming to you. JR kind of teased it at the beginning of the show. Um, we've had some great guests the last uh, three, four weeks or whatever. Hopefully you guys are enjoying season three so far. I know that you have to be enjoying the fact that you're getting the video simultaneous with the audio. Um, and I've, I'm hopeful that the quality has been a little better. That's been our goal. Um uh, and I feel as though we've pretty much achieved that. Um, so we, we've had, again, some great guests. Uh, thanks again to Kevin Nagandi today. Um, a lot of fun and something different, especially going into March Madness. We thought it would be cool to have him on. Um, but next week, again, as JRTs, we're going to be playing some shows, so that's going to allow us the opportunity to uh, do the podcast together for the yep. first time in a long time. And we're going to have some uh, some of our band and crew on that will be with us. We're doing some acoustic shows, so we'll have both my guitar players, Roger and Josh, will also have on um, our production manager and kind of like the Wizard of Oz for our, our – uh, Basically, yeah. <laughs> our, All of our production uh, stuff, audio. Our team, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jeff will be on with us, which we didn't get to talk to in the last band cast, as we called it. So we have a couple band members, talk to them about what it's been like, um, you know, throughout the past year. Um, yeah. And um, and our, our, I guess our lead figure in our crew, uh, Jeff, and uh, it should be a lot of fun. We'll all be together, so it'll yeah. be a lot easier to do and be a lot of fun. And we'll be coming off a show or two and getting ready to play another show or two and so it should be fun yeah yeah it should be good so everybody send in any questions you've got for those guys because i'm going to get i'm going to pile up some q a and we're going to let the band and or josh and roger and jeff all jump on and gang up on some of this q a next week when we all get together and uh yeah so we've got those three acoustic shows out on the road this weekend which are all sold out um so that's good to know that it, people are still wanting to go to shows so we'll be able to book more off knowing that and then uh March 27th, there's still some tickets left for Billy Bob's, um, so y'all jump on that. I'm not sure if they're going to release any more. I know there's a few left now, and I'm hoping by then they actually release a few more as things change every week. Um, and then in April, we've got we've got to make an announcement here. I know we had mentioned in the last podcast we were going to do the live cast on March 19th. We've actually moved that. We're going to do it April 17th. So everybody mark your calendars. Go to gigslive.com. Justin Moore and April 17th we're going to do a live cast from the barn and it's going to be awesome like I said I've already seen the setup and how they're going to roll it it's going to be in 4k it's going to all the sound all the fun stuff so uh, y'all y'all pay attention and go ahead and be looking for that go ahead and get it now and 
set yourself a reminder so you'll know when that happens. But that's April 17th. We're going to do the live from the barn live cast. So anybody, we're not coming to your area anytime soon or you can't make these acoustic shows or Billy Bob's, y'all uh, make sure to get in on that and have a party, man. Everybody. And, uh, yeah. And, and, you know, and again, you can, get, you can get tickets to that uh, from your home at gigs.live gigs.live and that'll be april 17th it kind of the way to look at it is kind of like a, a pay-per-view if you're going to get the fight and have some folks over or something like that it's it's kind of the same concept so um looking forward to that it'll be a lot of fun it'll be me the whole band yep it's a full show yep. um and it in this as jr mentioned the setting for is is really really cool yeah it'd be a good one too um, so. to get your uh you know i just thinking about this a group's good too but even if it's just you and your your partner your significant other having a date night you know have have some drinks yeah. like have your own concert at your house put it on the big there screen you, go. you know go out to the go outside two, two step yeah. and, we, and we're gonna we're gonna play some new music as well that you guys have never heard so yeah awesome man well man i appreciate it today just kevin was great I guess we're going to get on out of here. I'm going to go see if they got my roof finished. And um, y'all stay tuned. I got to go to softball practice, and then I got to get to the beach to meet you, man. Yes. Looking forward to it, brother. We got about to get on this I, thing. I will. Uh, we got to knock down some oysters. Yes. Yes. I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to so, it. Hey, I got to get all my stuff packed up and get ready for the another band cast. So uh, I'm going to get all my stuff together, bring all your stuff we, and we'll, we'll, get it, we'll get us a setup going, and that'll be fun. No doubt about it. Uh, thank you guys for uh, tuning in as always, watching uh, as as always. Uh, again, we couldn't do this stuff without you guys. We very much appreciate um, your support. Please like, subscribe, and comment uh, on every forum that that you can. Uh, it uh, we don't know how it helps, but it does help. <laughs> so yeah. please do so. Yeah, and uh, you can check out all Justin's um, tour dates, any new insight on his new merch, new music, any of that kind of stuff. You can find a link to that live stream, all that at justinmoremusic.com. Uh, I'm J.R. The Handler. You can go to jrthehandler.com. I actually got some new uh, T-shirts in if you want to go on there and order you one of those. Um, and, yeah, it's uh, it's been a good one, good run. I'll see you in a few. Have a safe trip down. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in to this week's edition of the Justin Moore podcast I want to say a special thanks to kevin nagandi for on joining us on the podcast today as well as our sponsors founders brewery and bobcat company for any of you first time listeners out there at the end of each of our episodes uh, i like to do a little reading out of a book i've had that i've got a lot of use out of over the years uh, the book is by mr charlie daniels uh, and the book is called let's all make the day count the everyday wisdom of charlie daniels Chapter 23, Treasured Words. Gray hair is a crown of splendor. It is attained in the way of righteousness. Proverbs 16:31. My grandfather, or granddaddy as I called him, was born in 1895 and was a master woodsman. He could build a house or a boat, plant and harvest a crop, run a trot line, skin a deer, and he had a head full of common sense and know-how. I learned a lot from my granddaddy and quite a few of those old folks who crossed my path and passed on hard-earned wisdom and practical advice. I come from a day when people depended on themselves, accepted reality, and dealt with each situation as it came up. Without safety nets or health insurance, they lived in a smaller world. They chose to devote their attention and energy to taking care of the things they were able to handle and leaving the rest to the Lord. They knew all the shortcuts, the best fishing spots, where a big buck was apt to cross the, cross the road, the proper way to fell a tree, or the right spot to dig a well. Their word was as good as gold. Their counsel was wise and enlightening, and honesty came as natural as breathing. Never let gray hair, advanced age, or the fact that an elderly person may be out of touch with the times fool you into thinking there's nothing to be learned from them. Old dogs are slower, but they know more tricks. Let's all make the day count.